Okay, right, so let's get the first panel up. So, Yi Shuang Shu, Sherry. Did I say that right? Yeah, come on, come on up. Let's do a clap. Well, we're doing claps today. Come on. Yeah, that's it there. Good. There's going to be a chance for them to explain, you know, the background and stuff like that, what they do. So I won't, I won't uh, do that. So uh, Sarah, next. Alex, Alex Taylor. And another OG, come on. From Blockchain Manchester, James Morgan. Right, okay, so just to start with, um, I'm gonna, uh, you've got two mics by the way there, and um, you've got to share that time off for everyone. Okay, got some mic. Oops. Um, so let's just go um, from, from the end with James. Uh, introduce yourself and who you are, what you do, what your background is, stuff like that. Hi, I'm James. Uh, I am the eBay Web3 Engineering Director, but I've been, I've been in crypto since about 2017. Uh, one of the co-founders of Known Origin, which was an NFT marketplace. Um, just a real big crypto nerd in general, really. <laughs> cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex. I'm a contributor at, at Klimadao. Um, Klimadao is a, a carbon protocol. So my background's in, in carbon. And I was saying to James earlier, actually, four or five years ago, I was trying to sell some services for a, a different carbon, crypto carbon project in 2019 to known origin. Um, but yeah, keep continuing on, on the crypto carbon journey part of Klimadao now. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. So my name is Sarah Hall. I'm a partner in the law firm Walkers. We specialise in financial services and my specialisation is crypto. And I would say like 95% of the work I do is advising clients, whether they're startups, scale-ups, traditional financial services, institutions wanting to get into crypto. And I've been practising law at Walkers for five years. But previous to that, I was practicing law uh, for 25 years, primarily English law. So that's me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yi Shang Xu, and you can just call me Sherry. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the University of Manchester, and I'm teaching real estate finance. So that's basically my background. And I started doing research about tokenization of real estate uh, three years ago. So that's why I'm here, I guess. <laughs> Right, okay, so let, let's get started. Hopefully be quite organic. If you want to jump in with any of the questions, one of you probably should hold on, on, onto the mic. Right, we'll, we'll keep it going anyway. So let's get started. So we're going to jump straight in with a really easy question. And we say, are DAOs working? Um, so could the panel provide some real world examples of successful DAOs and their impact on the respective industries? So Alex, I'm going to start with you, mate, because you've got a great example of, uh, of what you're doing. So go for it, mate. So uh, I'm allowed to flatter my own Go for it, mate. Just go all, go all in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can give a quick intro um, to, to Klimadao. It, it might um, help bring some context, and then I can talk about the, the impact that we've had. The idea behind Klimadao um, was to uh, essentially apply Web3 technologies to, to the carbon markets. Carbon markets are, are 20 years old or so. Um, and they represent the, 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 the market that allows carbon credits to flow through from um, project developers to, to consumers, typically you know, referred to as offsetting. Um, quite a lot of the, the kind of analysis and commentary of, of the carbon markets is that they're, they're very inefficient, um, they're quite opaque, price discovery is, is a challenge. So consumers often, they're, they're price takers within the market. They don't kind of know um, the actual cost of a carbon credit or the margins that are taken within, um, within the market by intermediaries, for example. So the idea behind Klimadao was to, to use public blockchain technologies um, and, and build a market using that infrastructure. Um, we specifically used one, one piece of technology um, initially, so an, an automated market maker or a liquidity pool. So if you're familiar with SushiSwap or, or Uniswap, um, we essentially run a SushiSwap pool, but instead of putting ETH or you know, Matic or, or whatever in that liquidity pool, we put carbon credits in that liquidity pool. The, the benefit of doing that is this, this total um, transparency over the, the pricing. Um, of, of the assets within that liquidity pool. Uh, this, is, this is a benefit that can be received by 
by stakeholders within the carbon market. So that's quite powerful. In addition, the, the assets that are actually traded within the liquidity pools are, are also transparently tracked. So there's a, there's a provenance over the assets. So you can see what wallet they've been transacted on, uh, transacted through before they're deposited in the liquidity pool. And this, this provenance of, of a carbon credit is also a bit of a problem in the market. People don't know about where the carbon credit's been, what the carbon credit represents. So by using this public blockchain tech, um, we, we think we can do something really interesting for the carbon markets, and, and I think we have. Um, we incentivize the, the bridging of about 25 million carbon credits into our ecosystem, into our liquidity pools, which, which is a, a good chunk, about 1% of, of, of the carbon market in, in 2021 when we launched. About $5 billion worth of, of volume was traded through our liquidity pools. Again, that, that's a pretty big number. Demonstrates we've got a liquid efficient market going through our liquidity pools. Um, and we've started to see people come in, carbon market um, stakeholders come in and use these liquidity pools for, for their own benefit, for their own trading benefits, their own offsetting benefits, for example. So that's the kind of first element of Klimadao. We've used this Web3 tech to provide a service for the carbon markets. The second element of Klimadao is the DAO side of things, right? Which is kind of what Lisa was, was talking about earlier. So we've got a community um, represented by token holders who essentially can vote on and propose changes to the protocol. Um, that could be innovations at, at the protocol level, but it also could be um, defining how we spend our money. Um, what, what do we do with the assets within our treasury, which, which is carbon credits, but it's also uh, USDC or, or, or dollars. Um, and there's, there's two real things that the community have, have kind of shepherded us towards doing. Um, one is building out tech software. So we've built out infrastructure that allows those liquidity pools to become more and more accessible to carbon market stakeholders. Uh, maybe we can talk about this this later, um, but, but there's some barriers towards uh, actually scaling our tech out into the market. So we've been trying to kind of fix those, um, uh, address those barriers. Um, and then the second thing is actually using the USDC to invest directly in carbon projects um, through a community owned uh, mechanism, which I think is also a kind of very interesting thing that, that the DAO model enables. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we've, we've we're a good example of, of some impact that's been had within the carbon markets through this, this technology and this organizational structure. Cool. That's Let's start with you. <laughs> um, well, I'm just going to throw James in. Come on, James. Come on. Come on. Get, get straight in now, lad. You, you, you've been in the tech for, for, for ages, and uh, we were chatting about it and what, earlier. The question is, good examples of DAOs. Good examples. We're going to start with a positive. Mm. <laughs> I guess I, I'm not a DAO skeptic, but I think... Uh, I think I think there obviously are some good examples. You know, I think some of the collector DAOs out there, you know, that I'm part of a few, they've, you're very, very, you know, Squiggle DAO, for example, Flamingo DAO, you know, Fingerprint DAO. These are collecting, uh, art collecting based uh, DAOs, which I think are quite interesting. Uh, small groups of people, relatively small groups of people, capital formation to acquire pieces of historic cultural you know art you know you have a common purpose a sort of shared goal shared vision i think that they're they're pretty good from my side i, I although the the other side of the table is i think a lot of DAOs are like uh, like decentralization facades almost you know let's just launch a token stick a DAO on it call ourselves decentralized and i think that has proven in my from my experience to not really work but we're not going into the bad DAOs yet. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, S Sarah, you've done uh, at Walkers, you've done uh, creation of over 100 DAOs. Um, what, what's like the trends that you've, you've been seeing or what, what's kind of like the, the feedback from, from your, for your side? Yeah, so um, Walkers, Walkers has done yeah. over, over 100. Cayman Foundations are very popular, so we set up or help clients set up a, a Cayman Foundation, which is a structure that is is very popular, has been very popular since it was first invented. Um, I think with with DAOs, you know, there's there's a popularity there because it's word of mouth, and we constantly see folks wanting to set up a Cayman Foundation, and we we as as lawyers we will stand back and say, help us understand why you want that to set up suit your goals, what is it you're looking to achieve, what are the risks you need to mitigate. But time and time again, the Cayman Foundation is is used for DAO. So the trends we're seeing is just the popularity. And often we get asked, compare and contrast with other jurisdictions, and the Cayman Foundation often comes out as, as the popular choice. Why? 
why is the Caymans a popular choice for DAOs? Well, I think Ca Cayman law um, specifically invented uh, the Cayman Foundation. It was actually used for succession planning. Um, so tax avoidance. No. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a separate. We can have a separate conversation and about tax tax neutrality. <laughs> but Cayman Foundation is often used in a DAO context because um, it empowers the community. It doesn't need to have any shareholders at all. So you won't have, um, you know, the traditional company structure that Lisa was talking about, that your typical company shareholders, you know, they will vote. The community members, you know, won't, in a traditional company structure, you know, they won't necessarily have any visibility on decision-making. Whereas with the Cayman Dow, there aren't any shareholders typically, and the community will have a set of rules often that, you know, is agreed, they will have tokens, they will vote, and then decisions are made in, in a collective way. And I think, you know, pe people like that legal certainty that they've seen in the Cayman Islands, you know, the system is based on English law, um, any disputes that people have, you know, ultimately roll up to, to a court here in England. So a lot of our clients, you know, like, you know, like that legal certainty and the tried and tested links with with the UK, and there is tax tax neutrality. Yeah. So, <laughs> as an aside, <laughs> many of the DAOs are not income. You know, they're not profit generating. So there's, you know, that's not the reason people set up in the Cayman Islands because your typical DAO is not generating profits. Right? It's typically, I say typically, it's often used, you know, to, as Lisa was saying, Cayman Foundation is often there to promote, you know, the protocol, it's there to um, make grants, it's not, it's not used for profit making enterprise. So the foundation, you know, works, works very well in that sort of not for profit um, jurisdiction, to use another of Lisa's words. Um, Sherry, so you've been looking to this quite closely. Is there any examples that you, you think uh, benefits from using a DAO? Um, yeah, actually, I, uh, to get back to the first question, I think we can see that DAO is working and it's coming to uh, work uh, more and more often right now in the practice base. And I think in several areas, it can work pretty well. Uh, for example, uh, we can see the protocol DAO. Uh, MakerDAO like uh, as a good example and in the investment area we also have some DAOs very good example to um, put the funds together in the treasury and then to buy and sell the asset real world asset to make profit <laughs> not non-profit to make profit but also there are some cost-based DAO for example to uh, to act as an alternative for the charity or lobby lobbying group or some uh, grant program, for example. And I think in that area, maybe, uh, I, I know a project called uh, Big Green, and actually they are helping the communities and schools and the local, local communities to grow their own food in their own uh, space. So that's kind of using the grants in uh, that way. So those are the good cases I've seen. And uh, to my own expertise, I think buying uh, or making investment in the real world asset can be a good use case for DAO because it becoming more transparent in terms of the governance and the data sharing and the, um, like the, the, the transaction data is more uh, transparent. And also the ownership is more uh, trustless because uh, with this blockchain tech technology and network with the embedding the smart contract, uh, we don't have to deal with uh, the people that we trust or we don't have to use the third party. So that using the DAO uh, structure and uh, to buy or make investment in the real world asset might be a good use case. Yeah, cool, good answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so back, back to James. <laughs> So let, let's, um, you know, we've talked about some of the positives of DAOs. So um, you've, you've been in this space for a, for a long time, probably more than anyone maybe in it. No, no. Uh, I don't, yeah, anyway. But, um, so 
did you see, let's say three years ago, uh, four years ago, did you see the DAO space moving into to where it is now? Um, how, how's it evolved and, uh, in terms of your opinion um, and, and what, what kind of stuff are you seeing? Um, I, guess, I guess I feel like we, we've come out the other side of like DAO mania. You know, I feel like it was like the hottest thing since sliced bread a couple of years ago and everyone wanted to DAO. I feel like that has, maybe it, the DAOs are still growing and launching all the time, but it certainly isn't this like mania-esque. You probably say the same thing about all of crypto, but generally I think DAOs have cooled quite a bit. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest thing from my side. I think um, maybe some regulation, more certainty in the regulation space has done that. Maybe it's cooled it off. I know some, some DAOs have been sued in the States from what I know, you know, sort of claimed to be, you know, void of that sort of action. And it turns out that that's not the case. You know, they've had some, I can't remember the names. Of them. You, okay, DAO. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Some, in, some like investment and trading DAOs, I think they were. And really they were branded as joint venture of some sort. And then they were done as selling illegal securities in essence, even though there was obviously a DAO. I think, um, I think DAOs have proven quite successful in like capital formation, I guess, and like allocation of funds seems, um, but I think um, I think the idea I, I do struggle with the idea of a particularly a startup or a business running everything through a DAO. I just don't think it's nimble enough. I don't think it's agile enough, um, which is where some of my hesitations of, you know, let's just put a DAO on everything stem from really. Um, but generally, I think they they can be very useful for for certain things, the right things, especially if there's alignment with the members of the DAO. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Um, yeah, so um, we've tried to, to mix the panels up to, to bring a, a different perspective uh, on each one. Uh, and Alex, I'm going to pick on you again. Uh, so uh, you represent the, the, the DAO, basically. Um, what what like, struggles or challenges uh, have you come across recently? Uh, we talked about like regulation there and changes, and it's moving so fast. Um, like what, what's the battles for you looking forward in terms of how you move it forward uh, and adoption? Yeah, I mean, would reiterate the, the point made about running a business through a DAO. Um, KlimaDAO inadvertently <coughs> began to sort of run a business through a DAO. Um, spoke earlier about our kind of liquidity pool solution and that, that works, that's great. It provides useful service for the market, but we busied ourselves for about a year essentially doing research and development to, to build out this, this tech layer that allows um, carbon market stakeholders to access our liquidity pools and what do I mean by a carbon market stakeholder I mean a FTSE 100 company who wants to offset their carbon footprint um, can can they go through a broker yes they can can they go through Klimadow they could if we can get the tech in place for, for, for them to actually come in and access it um, but what we started to see is that we're, we're building out this tech but we haven't got the, the appropriate um, business infrastructure that allows us to I mean, simply invoice a company. We, can't, we haven't got a bank account. We're, we're fully on chain. We can't invoice a company. Um, if, if anyone wants to come in and, and use our tech, they have to be able to self-custody their assets. Um, now, there's, there's custody solutions out there for, for holding stable coins or Ethereum, whatever. But um, are there custody providers out there that let you hold um, digital carbon credits on the Polygon blockchain? No, there aren't. So who's, who's going to build that? So. Let's move on to like real world assets. It's quite a trend at the moment. Um, so Sherry, I know you've been looking into this. Um, so one particular use case for, for DAOs is uh, to be buying the real world assets. It's been a good set of use cases for this. Um, do you see any examples or obstacles that you see with, the, with this? I know, I know you've been looking into that. Yeah, actually, uh, in terms of the real world asset, I think one typical uh, use case or the example could be a uh, real estate because it's so illiquid, it's so lumpy. So it, the best way of uh, making the investment in it is to crowdfund and then to make the investment. That is where uh, that DAO can actually chip in because people want to can have a fractional ownership or say the shared ownership of that asset. So that can be a good use case. 
Yeah, but yeah, in the real world, there are a lot of challenges and uh, obstacles. Yeah, the first one, I think you already mentioned the regulations. Uh, not only that, because the regulation is not very clear yet. So in some places, it might be illegal securities, and in some places, it's okay. And also the, the legal structures, how to legally structure the DAO to hold this asset is very tricky, especially across different jurisdictions. And uh, if the DAO is loosely uh, structured, there might be some oversight issues to you can't really make sure that the, uh, the funds will be really used for that uh, asset. And I think uh, the other issue could be the tokenization process is still a little bit absent. Uh, how to map the uh, real world asset or the legal perspective of the real world asset to the digital asset is quite tricky and challenging at the moment. So it still needs to be figured out. Mm. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the challenges right now. Yeah, cool. Um, so what, one of the examples uh, I, I always see is uh, young people uh, struggling to get on their, their housing ladder. And one of the, the great examples you always see is about friends and family helping to like buy a house and tokenize it and so on and so on. Like, so I'm, I'm gonna ask Sarah, like, <laughs> how many years away, realistically, do you think we are from that kind of thing happening? Just a, just a wild guess, like in a, in a, in a legal framework, like, like are, we, are we close to that being able to happen? So I think, um, going back to one of the points Lisa made is that, um, you know the way the law thinks is is jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and the the challenge which Sherry's mentioned is a lot of the work that that we do is is global. So someone might come to us say, you know, I want to tokenize real estate, and you know we can do that from a say Cayman or British Virgin Islands or Bermuda perspective, and that's all well and good. So that's the first bit done, but then the next bit is is the distribution bit, so selling, it's like anything. I would say to people, it's, it's like paint in a way. Like I can make paint in one country, but if I make it with chemicals that are illegal in another country, then I can't sell that paint, but I have a distribution problem. So I think that if everything is done in one country, then or one jurisdiction, then you know, are we three years away, five years away, you know, potentially? Um, I think, you know, the challenge is where you get multiple jurisdictions because, like, we don't all speak the same language, right? So we don't all have the same laws and we don't have the same philosophy even about laws. So in my jurisdictions, whose laws I practice, as long as there's not a law prohibiting it and it's not against public policy, then, you know, then the world's your oyster, right? Within my jurisdictions. But the minute, like, I want to distribute, like, tokens into, say, Italy or UAE or somewhere else, then it's not that it's necessarily illegal, but it's just there's a whole lot of regulation coming in. So I think where we've got uh, a challenge thinking about like time frames for this is will we ever be in a place where there are like universal principles for for law and regulation? We don't have those for traditional financial services, right? But, you know, whether we'll get there with digital assets it is it, it's a big question. But there's a there's, there was a lot this year in terms of you know, great brains coming together with papers saying, right, okay, here are some international principles. So that's a long way of saying, I don't really know. But <laughs> if you stick to one jurisdiction, then I would say, you know, much sooner than if you want to do like a multi-jurisdictional um, tokenization and distribution. Cool. Uh, okay, so let's move on to tokenization a little bit. Um, James. <laughs> Um, in terms of the like tokenization of uh, things, like uh, we were chatting about um, just before we came in, like uh, real world assets from the past, like Pokemon cards, moving on chain, um, courtyard are doing it, and then they're sort of like releasing them as packs and stuff like that. Have you got any, any thoughts on uh, that kind of thing and, and where it's moving forward to? 
Yeah, I absolutely love it, to be honest. Um, you know, I'm a big, a big fan of Courtyard. And if you don't know, Courtyard is a, um, it's a, it's a, a collectible trading card marketplace, but you can, in essence, they do primary sale drops where they'll buy boxes of Pokemon, vault it, tokenize it, and you're basically buy an NFT that represents this pack of unopened Pokemon cards in a vault. And then you can have like an opening experience and you get your rarities. But it's also quite interesting where, say, you've got a rare uh, trading card. You can send it to them, they'll grade it, vault it, tokenize it, and you basically get spat out at the other end an NFT. So what's quite good about that is it, in theory, it allows you to have higher velocity trading, you know, access markets more easier, more liquid. You also then open up things like fractionalization, you know, uh, more gamification. You know, generally, I just think the idea of making physical collectibles digital, I think it's a, it's a strong movement, and I can see that really taking off in the next couple of years, really. Um, just because of mainly the benefits that I said, you know, open markets, more liquidity, more composability with on-chain assets, uh, opens up fractionalization. And also at the other end as well, it, it is safer in some respects because you've got your physical card graded and vaulted and securely stored versus having, would you want a $30,000 card underneath your bed in like your scrapbook? Or would you rather have it in a vault that you can uh, self-custody it and trade it wherever you want? So I think generally that sort of stuff is, um, you know, I'm very bullish on, I guess. And I, I can only see that getting bigger and bigger as uh, more people adopt that sort of style of um, technology. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think tokenization um, of real world assets is going to be the next big thing, especially going back to what people already have. Like Pokemon's a great example, because like you said, you know, everyone knows that. Um, and there'll be other things as well, like collectible things that can bring on chain and do interesting things with. I think uh, also um, moving forward, like Panini, um, the football cards, for example. So Danny Warbanks here at the front, it's been absolutely pestering me for about three weeks nonstop. He's been watching these these videos and people, is it, what do you call it, breaking? Breaking a box or something? Does anyone know about that? Put your hand up if you know about this trend like uh, that's happening at the moment. Of, uh, like, what, so do people go in on the same box and then split um, it and... So what you do is you, you, you pay for a team for a player. Yeah. So they, they go. Come on, put him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so what you do is you, there's a box that's open live and you'll pay for the team or the player rather than buying the box. So you pay a smaller amount, but say for like Man City, for example, and then when the pack's opened, if you get Man City player, Autograph you, you win. Yeah. If you could digitalize that asset and send it off like the court off, you know, that's great. I'll definitely look into that. Yeah, okay. Uh, any thoughts on uh, real world assets and tokenization? Any any good examples of Would that? You class a carbon credit as a real world asset, right? Yeah. I was just about to say that's yeah. exactly what we're doing. It's just we're doing it with a carbon credit rather than a, a Pokemon card. But it's you know, at the beginning when I said we're using Web3 tools in the carbon markets, it's, it's literally that. We're just doing what's what's happened over the past four or five years. People have been experimenting in DeFi and we're, we're trying to bring that to a, a pretty big um, real world market. So yeah, the Gleamadow provides the, let's say the market infrastructure in the middle of the market, but our closest partners are the guys who are physically tokenizing, physically digitally not maybe it's not physically digitally <laughs> yeah 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 oh, no. who, who are tokenizing word, word, <laughs> yeah yeah so so it's interesting i mean ultimately a lot of a lot of web3 DeFi stuff it's, it's been people messing around at the bleeding edge at the corners and now we're starting to see it get used for real estate for carbon credits um yeah all sorts of all is sorts it, of assets is there anyone that you're working with or like your friends or that like uh, contacted you are like they're doing similar things but in a different way yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of my friends or people that we've been involved in, um, been speaking to for years in in the environmental commodity space or, or carbon credit space, are, are very interested. I think still a bit of reticence for you know people who maybe are in more traditional businesses to be like, all right, let's let's get stuck in and let's do this. But but we're starting to see see a bit of movement um, we're starting to run pilot projects with with people who maybe you wouldn't usually expect to, to kind of want to be involved in this sort of thing but they're saying okay let's let's do a, a small scale one-time transaction let's demonstrate how we tokenize transact 
retire. So yeah, it's, it's happening slowly, slowly. A um, few, few more, few more years maybe, but, but we'll hit that critical mass eventually. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm just going to bring one question back to Sarah here, and I think you might have already answered it already. But uh, like, how how do you keep up with 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 all this movement uh, as a company? Really, do you just have to keep on your toes all the time? I know it's, you talk about location by location, but um, it, does it does it change like every week, and you've just got to keep up with it in terms of the you know how how you handle it? Everything at least are here and smiling. <laughs> We do talk about this. I mean, li literally, there's something every day. And the good thing is, I love it. So, it, it, you know, I'm constantly like reading things and like looking at posts. I find LinkedIn is a really good source of, of for, for my work, you know, it's a fantastic source of seeing what people have written about, what papers are out there. So, it is. It could be like twenty four seven if if I did the like discipline myself. Oh, but there is something all the time. As I say, you know the the bookie Dow. You know it it it's not a Cayman BVI case. It you know it's as you say, and it's a US. It was a US decision, but like, we're constantly looking at this because these. You know, these trends will also drive business to to my jurisdiction. So we see lots of, you know, lots of those developments will will drive business to us. So, you know, it, it's, um, I, I love it. So, so I could be doing that all the time. <laughs> okay, cool. That's good. Um, so the, the, the first panel that we've put together here, um, we've talked more about some of the tackles and, and, and DAOs. Uh, and tokenization. The next panel is, is about community. So what we're going to do now, Ander, Gray, uh, so we're going to do some Q&As. Just think about that as well, because the community part is going to be covered in the next bit, not to put you off with any questions, but uh, <laughs> feel free to, to uh, ask a question to the whole panel or anyone individual. Um, Andy's going to to pop round. Hello. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself and just say the questions? Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Luke. I'm with Software Engineer, not in crypto, sadly. Um, this one's for Alex. So when Prima is spinning out this tech org as a Swiss association or, or whatnot, what, or who or what is getting the economic benefit of that? Because that presumably has shareholders. Like, where does that go? You say it can go and be a profit-making business. Where does that economic benefit go? What is the beneficiary of that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, an association wouldn't wouldn't have shareholders, um, but the, the 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 way we look at Klima DAO, Klima DAO is a success if um, more and more people, organisations use its liquidity pools, um, and that's going to be a function of the quality of the carbon credits, um, the number of carbon credits, and if 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 our value prop is, is good enough and, and our liquidity pools are, re are really offering something useful to the market, then then hopefully it will come. Um, but it's not all just about bringing supply on chain for a carbon credit. The purpose of a carbon credit is to consume a carbon credit, so you, so you offset the credit. So the idea is if Carbon Mark can go out there, engage with the market and bring demand into our liquidity pools, Klimadow ultimately benefits. Um, the alternative, the kind of baseline of, of not spinning out Carbon Mark um, is not knowing whether people will build the demand rails for our um, assets, which is which is a risk, um, because somebody could, I suppose, in theory, also spin up liquidity pools and compete directly with with our LPs. So, so we want to kind of enable that infrastructure layer to get built out. And then we're a DAO, so everything we've ever built has been um, open sourced. So somebody could just go ahead and, and fork the whole the whole product. So the product's called Carbon Mark, CarbonMark.com. Check it out if you want to buy some carbon credits. Um, <laughs> So look, the the idea is if 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 we put some momentum into this, we 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 drive Carbon Mark forward on Klimadao's rails. Carbon Mark can benefit, pursue its incentives, whilst also essentially operationalizing these assets that that Klimadao has, that Klimadao hasn't sat in its LPs. So, from a community member perspective, um, they they should be compelled by that by that proposition, even if they're not having shares in Carbon Mark of 
etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you can imagine the, the, the type of questions that would be asked. So, um, would if, if you're interested, recommend reading the forum. It's it's super long. It's very esoteric. It might be boring, but if if you're kind of into that sort of stuff, I think I think it's an interesting kind of process and case study. Thank you. Okay. Someone there. I'll go. I saw you as well. You're on the panel. We can't ask questions. It's for James. It's not else. I'm well. I'm a software engineer. I'm Anthony. So I'm a I think it was described earlier as they're sort of similar to cooperatives. Um, have, yeah, have you seen any cooperatives move towards a DAO, or and like if if not, like do you think there's a reason why like more traditional cooperatives aren't moving? I can't remember the names, but there's definitely been a few DAOs that have tried to launch cooperatives, um, from what I know. Um, I saw Dan's hand go up. Maybe, maybe you guys have done that. I don't know. And I know with Lisa as well, when we've spoken many years ago, was involved in setting up a DAO with yeah, working cooperative uh, as a, some sort of DAO structure. I think it, the analogy is uh, very valid in my mind, but I, I, I still think there is still quite a lot of difference in, you know, DAOs seem to be quite good at like allocating capital based on like community direction, but you know there's more than that in running a cooperative, I guess. You know, and is it just about the money for DAO? Is there more to it? You know, I still think like voting in a DAO is a bit of a bit of a sham, right? You know, maybe sham's a strong word, but if it's like one token, one vote. Yeah, one token, one vote. Plutocracy. You know, what's what's going to stop a whale? You know, like ApeCoin has got a DAO, ApeDAO. There's been some pretty controversial votes gone through there in the last six months. Uh, big, oh, sorry. <laughs> big whales coming in and <laughs> like pushing the vote in their direction. You know, I'm not convinced that's really in line with a cooperative. You know, so I think there's still quite a bit of a gap there in my mind. Right, okay. Cooperatives were invented in Manchester, by the way, in Rochdale. They were. They were. <laughs> they were. We, we've. If, if it's interesting, we just moved to quadratic voting in our DAO, which is meant to be anti-plutocratic, but of course got a load of criticism when we went to quadratic anyway, so I mean, damned if you do, damned if you don't, I suppose. Yeah. Well, there's a question here. Hi, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, this one from Sarah. Um, is there any laws that can stop bad actors railroading through a DAO? Can they, is there any um, laws that prevent um, a DAO railroading a project or a business, like negatively? So I can speak for the laws that I, I practice, which are um, sort of inspired by English law, very loosely, I would say. So a, a lot of what we see within our jurisdictions is the, what's agreed you know, between the different DAO members. Those are the rules of the road, right? So it's, we would say as lawyers, it's contractual or it's just consensual. So it, it doesn't matter. We're not really looking at the law, we're looking at what's all being agreed by the, the DAO members of Trump make, makes sense. And when, and when you say that, Sarah, are you talking about the rules of the, the smart contracts, the on-chain rules, or is there other type of rules that you, you're talking about? So, so what we see when we have Cayman Foundations is that um, you don't need to have, but frequently, there will be agreed what we call bylaws, and that's just the agreed rules of the road as to what the voting rights are and you know how this will be governed. Because a lot, you know, to the point that was made before, that you know, governance of the DAO is important. Otherwise you have a sort of free for all and you can have, you know, bad behaviours. So there aren't any laws, I would say, in the jurisdictions that I practice that prevent the DAO from behaving in a certain way. It's it's agreed amongst you know the DAO members what the what the bylaws are going to be. You can't make sense. Good answer. Uh, could in, sorry. James, this is for you, mate. Sorry, just a quick one because I was curious. Um, in the arts. DAOs that you were talking about for not R style, the, the R styles that you were talking about. How are the sales triggered? Like, how, how, who decides that? What, how does the. So it's usually, um, I guess. Uh, it's like voting, right? At the end of the day, there's usually closed forums where members can access, discourse commences, 
uh, enough capital is agreed and it's allocated to make a purchase of a particular collection or like squiggled out that I'm a member of, for example, they have a particular mission, right? The mission is like to, to acquire and lift up uh, Chromie Squiggles, which is an Artbox project, one of the first, and get, you know make its uh, name and image recognizable and like a cultural you know point f for the future. You know, and if I, I'm always keen on if there's a, sh a shared mission like that, you wouldn't be part of the DAO if you weren't for it. And it's often holders, and they do have voting tokens. So it's typically done from what I've seen anyway. Discord channels, forum channels, uh, long, lengthy discussions where agreement is. Uh, uh, you come to agreement on the capital formation allocation, and then you pull the trigger and make a purchase. Um, I could probably ask loads of questions, but it's probably, I'll aim most of them at Lee in the next one, probably. Uh, <laughs> um, this is about Swiss associations. We at YGG switched from a British Virgin Islands to a Swiss, I wasn't a part of why or how, so I'm just intrigued why we would have done that. Is it to do with it's onshore rather than offshore? So I, I can, as a British Virgin Islands lawyer, I can have a stab at have a stab at that, and th this will be speculation. But um, and it really goes around to choice of jurisdiction and what are the goals, right? So um, we we don't in the British Virgin Islands have a foundation or a kind of association like Switzerland. Um, there is something which is called company limited by guarantee. That's quite esoteric. Um, it doesn't function quite in the same way as say a Cayman Foundation or a, or a, or a Swiss Foundation. Um, so that's one of the reasons people move jurisdictions is the corporate structure or the, you know, the, the, the legal structure that they've chosen doesn't meet their goals. The, the other reason we see is regulation. So it could be that people do actually want to be regulated. We tend to find that, you know, where people are looking for external capital, then, you know, certain investors will have a preference for a, a particular jurisdiction. And if they're jurisdiction neutral, some of them may only be able to invest in a, in a regulated entity. So we see... You know, we do see that movement between the different jurisdictions. Sometimes it's very investor-led. It can be founder-led, but a lot of it's driven by the fact there is or there, there isn't regulation, if, if that makes sense. So those are two and the reasons. The other reason we, we often see people moving from Switzerland to Cayman is um, the speed at which things can be sort of metabolized by um, if, you, if you want to set something up and you want to set it up fast, you know, you can set something up fast in Cayman, probably take 10 days start to finish. That won't be the case for some other jurisdictions. And um, other jurisdictions may require a certain amount of capital. Um, and people do look at, well, how much capital do I need to put in this? And if, you know, if we become fully decentralized and we abandon everything, we just close it all down. What happens to our capital? So, um, th those are some of the drivers for like moving from jurisdictions, if that makes sense. And the chocolate's better in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> the beach is better in the British photo. <laughs> <laughs> what about watches? Um, right. nope. One more, Yeah, we've got one, one more. Doing, doing well on time. And this is a question for all the panel, really. I think we all know that, um, like you said, that DAOs can be gamed. I'm a big believer in DAOs, but I said I haven't come to a kind of solution in how to, to avoid that happening. And, you know, when, you know, you see examples like Arbitrum earlier this year where there was a vote and then they just ignored it anyway, you know, that does make you a little bit um, suspicious of, of, as a whole concept, if you like. So, yeah, I just wondered if the panel had any thoughts on how we could... <coughs> 
So I can kick off with some thoughts. Uh, I mean, you could you could move to more automation. So uh, what a lot of DAOs do at the moment is they use Snapshot, which is off-chain voting, and then it's up to the core team or the trustee or whoever to, to implement things. So you could actually do on-chain voting um, and then deploy smart contracts based on, on the votes going through. Obviously, there's risk with that. I think Beanstalk was exploited last year because they had on-chain voting and someone shoved through a vote on a weekend. So yeah, it's, it's, it's risky, but but, but automation is one, one way to do it. Um, I think over time, as DAOs become more serious, um, that, that trust, I mean, DAO, the Web3 tech's meant to be trustless. But I, I do think there's there's a case that you know DAOs need to prove themselves over the long term as responsible in our case stewards for for the environmental commodities markets. But you know there, there'll be other cases. So so hopefully as they mature, maybe the regulatory um, frameworks mature and, and DAOs feel like they can operate properly within the regulatory frameworks. We'll, we'll see the space mature. Um, hopefully the guys who do it well uh, will will keep doing it well and uh, we'll, we'll start to see it see it scale. Um, I guess uh, two thoughts spring to mind. Some DAOs have got like a two token uh, model where they have a token that is in essence soul bound to the participant where you can accrue things like reputation and then your <laughs> voting power is not just on the coins you own, it's also on the rep that you earn. I know DXDY have done that um, with some success, you know, some success I would say, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a pinch of salt. I think it's also interesting if you look at runes make a dow end game sort of like extremely long um post about where the the future of make a dow is going he also signals of using things like ai to their uh, to their power so this is an impartial uh, rules-based uh, agent that will in essence score participation and factor that into um, things like voting rights and stuff so i think automation some form of automation plus you know, some sort of like proof of humanity reputational score might, uh, you know, stop the civil issue, you know, those sorts of things, maybe the end game. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think automation is one way to do it because in practice, I think that the devil is in the details. For example, tokenized real estate is all very well, a pretty idea about fractional ownership of real estate, but afterwards you need to manage it and during the whole process of management for the property, there are so many detailed, uh, so many detailed decisions to make. So if the, the DAO, when it's structured, it can be strictly structured and codify all the process into a multi automation way, then you can really avoid a lot of hassles afterwards, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. It's, uh, right, so we're going to have uh, a 10 minute quick break. Um, do you want to thank the uh, panel? Uh, give them a round of applause for you.